My name is Ken Elsinga. I teach in the economics department at the University of Virginia. I'm sitting here in my office in Monroe Hall, and I'm uh, not exactly the host, um, but I'm sort of serving in that role to at least get the uh, economic and litigation consulting night underway. But I want to give uh, just a, a warm word of thanks to the Economics Career Office and the University of Virginia Career Center. They're the people really responsible for, uh, for this happening this evening. Uh, I want to mention to the consulting firms that are here. First of all, welcome to Grounds in a digital sense or a pixelated sense. Um, and I just want to say that uh, somebody who's taught at the University of Virginia for many years, there's a lot of talented students here who I think from my own experience in working with firms um, like yours, that they have the, the blend, and it is a blend of analytical skills and the interpersonal skills that I think are fundamental to do work in litigation consulting. So I'm hoping that uh, this time, this uh, late afternoon is a, a time of efficient matching markets for you with some students at UVA. But I want to say particularly remarks to the students who are uh, on this digital conference. Um, you probably are unaware of what a remarkable occasion this is for you. In some ways, it's a cliche, but this type of event is like a dream come true for me. Because for many years, as someone who has worked in the field of litigation consulting, I've always had a a sense of, wow, I wish more students knew about this. I wish they knew what, the, what this labor market was like, what the service of these firms was like, that they could learn in more detail of the richness of this type of opportunity. And it was always at a distance. We didn't have a, 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 a career evening or a gathering like this, and now we do. And so what you're unaware is, is first of all, how remarkable this is, but you also may not be aware that the firms that are here are just premier firms in litigation consulting. There is not a second tier firm represented here. Uh, I know this because of the reputation of the firms. I know it from personal experience. I've worked with a number of these firms. Um, I can attest to how they, they leverage my time. I have been on the opposite side in antitrust cases with some of these firms, and I am well aware of the quality of work that goes into the work that they do on the other side. Um, what these firms do, and I, there's no false modesty in my saying this, is they make me look smarter than I am. And they also keep me from making errors in analysis that I would otherwise make. Um, so these are, are, are firms that take the services of a, sometimes a so-called expert and really develop that person's expertise. They leverage time, they, they just do many services, and they do it because they've got the resources, both the, um, the capital equipment, but also just lots and lots of smart analytical people who range the spectrum from people who've just graduated from universities like UVA to people who have been doing this for years and have a wealth of experience. That wealth of experience carries over to the young analysts who have the opportunity to be trained um, in, uh, in, in this field to develop much more human capital than we could give you through classes in econ and the comm school and data science here at UVA. Uh, I wanna give a particular shout out to uh, Bates White and Berkeley Research Group or BRG. They have a particular role uh, in sponsoring what goes on uh, this evening and a couple of them are gonna speak soon. I'm gonna introduce them, uh, but before I introduce couple of the speakers and you get a chance to mingle uh, through handshakes with the firms that are involved here. I wanna mention a brief handful of questions that I get in my office a lot with students in my antitrust policy class, econ majors who are interested in um, economics and litigation. Um, and these are the kind of questions that I hope will be answered by the speakers or through your discussion tonight. Um, First of all, what kind of training do you get if you go with the firms that are represented here? You get definite training. This is not just you go in and do work and do output. There's real human capital accumulation that occurs. It's one of the reasons these jobs are so valuable for a lot of young people. 
it's it's the experience of what they take away as well as what they contribute to the output of the firm. So be alert to this. What kind of training do you get if you go with the type of firms that are represented here? Then I know from watching and working with a lot of young analysts in firms like these that part of the work is, is alone. You're, you're working at a monitor, computer monitor by yourself. You're reading documents. You're by yourself. And you have to have the tenacity to do the kind of work, dog work that's required. But there's also teamwork. It is very much a team effort. And so be on the lookout for the kind of communication skills that these firms are looking for, in addition to what I'll just call the narrow analytical skills that are, are required here. And then there's a conception, maybe it's a misconception, that if you work as an analyst in a litigation consulting firm, you do this for just a couple of years and then you go somewhere else. So this is what lawyers would call a compound question, but look for people who can describe uh, the career path for those analysts who stay longer than two years. And, and those who do leave, where do they go? What kind of opportunities do they pursue after a couple of years? And then finally, and then I'll quit rambling at this point and turn it over to uh, Ben Shear, who I'll introduce from Bates White. Um, what does it look like to have a long-term interest uh, with one of these firms? That is, you're not thinking, oh, I'll go here for two years and then get a PhD in economics, or I'll go here for two years and get a law degree. What does it mean to stay in this field and work long-term to make a career of it? So you might be looking for answers to questions like, if you were interested in that, should you go to grad school first? Or can you work as an analyst, go to grad school and come back and have long-term careers in this? So to kick off answering this and other questions and just describing the field more fully, I'm gonna to go to people who aren't outsiders to it the way I am uh, using these firms to help me in my uh, consulting. Uh, but I'm gonna ask Ben Shear to come on in just a minute. Ben um, works in a, in a kind of a field of forensic consulting that's a little bit different than what I do. I do mostly antitrust work. Ben is involved in a lot of large database analysis. He works in some of the industries that I've worked in, particularly pharmaceutical industry, but um, his field goes way beyond pharmaceuticals. He's worked in medical devices, life sciences generally, uh, even working in things like False Claims Act, which is really foreign to what uh, I would do in antitrust. He works sometimes with the Department of Justice, making presentations there. I've done that as well. But he also works with other agencies that are not unique or they're, they're in the law and economics field, broadly construed, but they're not specifically antitrust. Um, he works a lot more with data than I do. I tend to work a lot more with written documents uh, as, as in my world of antitrust consulting. But Ben, if you'd come on board and talk about your experience with, uh, with Bates White. And again, thank you for being here. Uh, I'll just say as an aside, um, I have been opposite Bates White and uh, I've just really been impressed by the quality of work that you guys do. Great. Well, I appreciate that. And, and Professor Elzinga, thanks for the warm welcome. And I think that that was a, a really nice summary of, of this field and this type of work. Um, and I hope one day we can uh, work on the same side of a case together as opposed to, to opposite each other. So I'll be looking out for an opportunity for that. But let me start with a brief introduction. And, and what I want to accomplish, I'm going to talk for five, 10 minutes, is, is just really give people kind of a feel for economic consulting. It's one of those things that at least in my experience, can be really hard to explain what it is you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. But hopefully coming out of that, out of this and, and tonight's uh, meetings through Handshake, you get a feel for it. And as Professor Elzinga said, obviously I'm biased. I've been in this field for a while, but I think it's a really rich field, a lot to offer, a lot to learn, and a really rewarding career. So let me just start by saying, um, I'm, I'm a partner at Bates White. I do primarily work in what we call our life sciences practice, uh, as opposed to what Professor Elzinga said, uh, working on, as he does, monopolization cases. I do a lot of cases involving pharmaceutical products, medical device products, um, healthcare providers. That's sort of my niche. But we also do a lot of work in antitrust and other areas, and I've done my share of antitrust work over the years. I've been at Bates White now for almost 20 years. Um, can barely believe it every time I say it, but I sort of have had a unique, uh, somewhat unique career path where I joined Bates White right out of college. 
And uh, unlike most people in the field who have gone back and gotten graduate degrees, I just kept learning and building at Bates White and developing my expertise, um, learning about data analytics, learning about economic methods, and have been able to sort of develop into a testifying expert where I'm retained as an expert on cases. That's not the most common path, but it is one that's available that uh, I want to make sure people understand is there are many ways to um, gain intellectual capital and become an expert. One is to get uh, continued education. Another is to stay in the field and keep learning and growing. So that's something that I think will come up as I talk and as you talk with others uh, at my firm in the, in the follow-up meetings. A um, couple of other quick notes. I have two young kids at home. It will be a miracle if they don't interrupt in this next 10 minutes. So if you hear screaming, that's what's happening. Uh, they are four and eight, and this is about the hour where they get antsy. So hopefully we're safe. So let me just start with a little bit of background on uh, economic litigation consulting, and then I'll talk about Bates White specifically, and I'll try to keep this short. Uh, so as I said before, I didn't know anything about economic litigation consulting before I started on it. I, I took a course in college 20 years ago called uh, Econ and Law, and I thought, wow, this seems interesting. I wonder if there are any jobs that do this, and uh, fortuitously found this industry and found Bates White. And so a couple of things that I think people should know about this type of work. One, most of the work that you do in this industry is in a legal, in the sort of involving a legal or regulatory dispute. So unlike what people often think of as management consulting, where you're maybe advising a company on strategy, oftentimes what we're dealing with here is a lawsuit. You know, one company suing another saying, uh, you know, they've monopolized a market or one company suing another saying, you've marketed your product in a way in my world, we often see that uh, is inconsistent with FDA's guidance. And so we're brought in in the context of those sorts of le legal and regulatory disputes to offer expert analyses and expert opinions. So a couple of things that I think are really interesting about this. One is typically the other side, pretty much every case, has their own experts too. As Professor Elzinga described, he's been on cases opposite us, we've been on cases opposite him. And this is one of the things that I really like about the work because you can't just come in and say, oh, let me just make something up today and see if it flies. You've got really smart people on the opposite side critiquing your work, looking at the analysis that your team has done, looking for errors, um, hoping that they can find something to kind of undermine your approaches. So to me, that's really enjoyable about it because it requires you to hold yourself to a really high standard. The work has to be robust. The work has to be supported. The work has to be careful. Um, and that's something I really enjoy about it. Another aspect of it I enjoy is there's a lot of variability in the work. Uh, you tend to work on a lot of different issues, a lot of different industries. So I would bore you all to tears with all of the different cases I've worked on, but I, I was just listing some before we got on the line. And it's been everything from uh, monopolization cases involving microchips to marketing tactics of a pharmaceutical company to a medical device and whether it's reading out the correct results and all there are there false positives and false negatives to poker. I actually had a case that involved poker and whether poker is a game of skill or a game of luck. Um, so you end up getting involved with a lot of different types of issues and doing really interesting types of analyses. And so in short, in my view, it doesn't get boring. You know, it keeps you on your toes. You're always learning something new. Um, relatedly, I think it's, it's challenging work. I, I can't, you know, as I said, I've been doing this for, uh, about 20 years and it's never, e every day there's a new challenge. It's never, oh, let me just come in and you know, pull the crank and the analysis will run and we'll be good. It's always something new to think about, which is also something I really enjoy. So before I keep talking too much, let me just talk a little bit about Bates White and then I'll hand it over to uh, my friends at BRG to give an overview uh, from their perspective. But before I do that, a few things that I think to me stand out about, about Bates White. Obviously I'm biased, I've been there for 20 years. But first, it's a very collaborative environment. I think, you know, a lot of firms say that, but I think it really is in the DNA of how we work. Uh, one of the things I've greatly missed during uh, this period of time where everything is virtual is we do a lot of Teams and Zoom meetings, but I do really miss being in person with people. Uh, I've got a whiteboard in my office, sort of writing up things on the whiteboard, exchanging ideas. Um, we try to do that as well as we can during this period of virtual work, which uh, I think we've done a good job at but it's always been kind of a hallmark of how we work, what we do, that it's collaborative team-oriented work. 
And I think that still is true today. Um, and I can't wait to get back and do more of that in person. Um, another, another point that I think I made earlier is it, Bates White is a place where there's a career path, even if one does not have an advanced degree. I think that's illustrated by my own career path. Obviously, people go on to a lot of different things. So hear more about that today. We have people go get MBA, masters, PhDs, go back to law school. But for someone who is interested in continuing to grow within their role at Bates White, that is a distinct possibility and one that people like myself have done. Uh, and then finally, uh, last little plug is something that I enjoy about uh, Bates White is there's a lot of not uh, work related things that people do together. So happy hours. Uh, we sponsor a soccer team that plays in a, tur a, a tournament that raises money for charity. There's endless numbers of things that, you know, we're still doing some of it. It was a lot better in person, but we're going to, con we're continuing to try where there are opportunities to get to know your colleagues outside of a strictly work uh, based environment, which is really nice. And one of the things I enjoy about the job. So I think I've uh, taken up my allotment. So I will stop there and uh, hand it over to uh, my friends at PRG. Yeah, actually, uh, this is Ken Elzinga. I'm going to introduce uh, Kevin, but uh, if I can just put a footnote on something that Ben said, which really resonated with me, and I just want to underscore it as, uh, as the professor on the call, the variety of work. Um, you know, maybe some people enjoy doing the same thing day after day and really becoming an expert on that one thing. But in litigation consulting, the experience that I've had, Ben has mentioned this, it's not unique to the two of us, the opportunity to work in a variety of markets. So if you have your career at Procter & Gamble and for years and years you work on the disposable diaper industry, marketing Pampers and Loves, well, that's what you do. And that's an important social service, especially to new moms. But if you want variety in your work, consulting does that. I think litigation consulting offers more variety than management consulting. I can't prove that, but that's an observation that I have. And then second thing that Ben mentioned, and this will be underscored, I suspect, by Kevin, that's the collaborative nature of the work. Um, I, too, miss the opportunity of just brainstorming. And the brainstorming um, is not just with the guys who've been there 20 years, like Ben. The analysts will be brought in oftentimes for, to brainstorm because they may have some unique thing they're working on that they will contribute to the group collaborative effort to brainstorm. Okay, I want to introduce Kevin uh, Christensen from BRG or Berkeley Research Group. Kevin works more in the area that I work in, which is antitrust. He has a long uh, experience in that. His track record academically is, is different. Ben went through all of this experience gaining capital without a degree beyond his bachelor's degree. Kevin's a PhD in economics like myself. He directs the Washington office of, uh, of BRG. He not only is engaged in antitrust consulting, he works as a scholar in the area by editing one of the magazines in the field, uh, works with the Global Competition Review. And, uh, and uh, so welcome, Kevin. I'm going to turn it over to you and let you respond and talk a little bit about the field. And again, one of the things I hope to take away with, with the students on the call is, is you'll see how different this can be from management consulting. And in my view, <laughs> I'm biased like Ben said earlier, to my mind, it's a much richer experience uh, in terms of a vocation than management consulting. Kevin, thanks for being with us from BRG. Thanks too for helping to host the event tonight. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Um, just a, a little bit about, about me, just like uh, Professor Elzinga said. Um, uh, so Kevin, I work out of the, the Washington DC office, uh, have a PhD in economics. Uh, I did not go directly to graduate school after uh, undergrad. I, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do when I grew up. Uh, I'm not exactly sure still, uh, but nevertheless, um, I uh, did three years of consulting at Ernst & Young. And so got into the, the tax policy consulting area understood a little bit more about, um, you know, what I wanted to do when I grew up. And, and that was a really formative experience for me. I, I learned really three things. I, I loved working with PhD economists and I wanted to become one. Um, I loved consulting because of the variety of work that we, we do in consulting. Uh, and I really didn't particularly enjoy tax policy work. Um, but, the, but the nice thing about that experience is I did work on a project that really, um, I can kind of directly line up my career path to where I am now to one project that I had when I was in, in consulting. It had to do with um, uh, state and local income tax at the internet. And at the time, that was a really big issue. Uh, but that got me very interested in innovation uh, and the economics of competition and entrepreneurship. Uh, and so that led me to 
uh, study innovation and the economics of innovation in graduate school. And then that led me on, on the path, path here to, to looking at competition economics uh, 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 at BRG. So a little bit uh, about BRG, some of you are probably uh, familiar with it, but we are a global uh, consulting firm. We are an expert services firm. Most of our clients are uh, law firms involved in dispute, uh, whether uh, it be antitrust, which is the area that I'm primarily focused in, or class action litigation, which could be labor employment, intellectual property, or whatever. Very diverse set of, of opportunities, uh, or a very diverse set of questions that are put forward to us that we have to use our the full economist toolkit uh, to engage in. So, and when I say full econo economist toolkit, I mean, we're diving into the economic literature, we're diving into the theory, trying to, uh, in including brushing off our intermediate microeconomics textbooks from time to time, just to make sure that everything that we're saying meshes with, with uh, intermediate micro, uh, looking at our econometrics, dealing with um, uh, econometric uh, and data science type questions, uh, really to come in with a very fulsome and compelling analysis um, to help uh, us understand uh, what the economic issues are at play, put them in the context of the allegations themselves, and then come up with a very thoughtful opinion that is grounded and rooted within economics um, uh, and, and all of the tools that an economist can provide. Um, like I said, I started out in a different type of consulting than, than what we're involved in right now. So litigation consulting is very different. And, and I have to say that because I had that comparison, um, I can say I definitely like litigation consulting more, uh, not merely because the, you know, uh, it's front page Wall Street Journal news, I was able to work on that, um, those types of matters with the well, uh, when I was at Ernst & Young, but mostly it was because I felt it was very much like my team versus the other side's team. I wanted to make sure that my team was in the best position possible, given the facts, given our understanding of the data, given our analyses, that we um, had the best report, best output that we could get um, to, uh, to convince the judge, the jury, whomever, the finder of fact, um, that our opinion was the right one. Um, and so I, I find that to be that team aspect, that uh, almost competitive nature, it's like basketball or whatever. Um, I found that to be just a, a wonderful environment to work in. Uh, and it absolutely points to the collaborative nature that, that Ben was talking about and uh, Professor Elzing was talking about earlier, very much collaborative. Um, there's also another interesting element to my career path. So I did take a, uh, what I call lovingly referred to as a sabbatical from BRG fairly recently, uh, where I went to a Fortune 200 company and spent two years there in the marketing department. And it's exactly what uh, Professor Elzing described. It's you learn very much a lot of depth in one very narrow area, diapers uh, was the example. Um, and, and so that was nice. It was interesting, you got to learn depth, but then you didn't get that breadth that I was able to experience in consulting. Uh, and so it was that breadth that I was missing, that com uh, complexity. And also there was some virtue for me at least uh, in being surrounded by fellow economists and fellow PhD economists. I was one of two economists at, uh, at the company I was at. Um, and that was just not enough. There wasn't enough collegiality, uh, collaboration, uh, and work to, to, to really get our juices flowing and really tackle an issue. Um, I also tended to find out that there were, it was death by meetings and death by PowerPoint. Uh, I think during that two-year time, I, I did a lot more PowerPoint presentations than I ever did in my entire career as a consultant. Um, and so it was just a very different experience. I'm, I'm without question, very happy that I did it. Um, but in terms of just balancing the different aspects of my careers and my career and what I wanted to do uh, and what I thoroughly enjoyed, uh, it was the work at BRG and the work that um, we were doing at, in litigation consulting that really uh, drove my interests and, and drove my passions. Um, as far as kind of like how BRG works and the types of matters, I've mentioned that we have a, a wide variety of different matters. Um, healthcare is one, antitrust, IP are the, are the big ones in the DC office. Um, but in terms of how we organize, it really depends upon the size of the case. Sometimes it's a really big, huge class action antitrust litigation that we all have to, you know, there's uh, 10 people working uh, for the entirety of the case. Sometimes it's just me and an associate. Sometimes it's just me. So it really depends upon the scale of the case. And so 
the nice thing about the work that we do is there are big cases, there are small cases. Uh, and so you do get different opportunities to uh, learn different things and work with different experts uh, and see how they approach and tackle things differently, uh, which has been a wonderful uh, experience because every expert thinks differently based upon their experience, based upon their training, uh, and to get that diversity, not just of the topic of the industry, uh, but also of thought uh, is just extremely rewarding and, and helps to develop you as a, a very well-rounded individual, if not a professional. Um, one of the best things that we really enjoy at BRG is how we work together with our associates. So you're not assigned in a, in a silo. Um, you work across practices, you work across experts. So it is not uncommon for our associates to have experience on healthcare matters and then their next one be an intellectual property case. And then have their next one be a public policy question. And then have the next one be something else, uh, antitrust class action. Um, and so there's just a wide array of opportunities available to our associates. Um, and that includes quantitative and qualitative questions. Sometimes we want people to dig into the literature, dig into the research, the documents to really understand the facts of, of the industry. Sometimes we want you to do with, with the data and just be the, the, the data programmer and figure out kind of the, the right kind of the data to, that would really unlock an understanding that we see. More often than not, what we're seeing, however, is that you need to combine both the data and the documents together to make the data speak. That additional context of what was going on and how they were communicating those emails they were discussing, corresponding with what we're seeing in the data are really just an amazing connection that really help us to unlock and understand the data. Uh, in a way that you probably wouldn't get necessarily in uh, a non-consulting environment or in a, uh, in a, a consulting environment that didn't have discovery. Uh, there you would have, and I can speak personal experience at Ernst & Young, we were doing a lot of, uh, let's look at public reports, let's look at um, you know, government studies, let's look at those kinds of things. Whereas here, we are actually getting emails from an individual who uh, was sitting in their desk five years ago who didn't realize that I was going to be reading their email five years later. Um, and, and, and that just helps to really uh, uh, let the truth come to light and help us to really understand what's going on and what they were thinking at that time uh, when we see certain patterns in the data. Um, so that's, that's just a really great aspect to it. You really get the full picture uh, given the information that, that's available uh, to us. Um, I mentioned that there's just a whole bunch of uh, different variety of work and different types of projects. But the other thing that's interesting is because of the diversity of projects and because we kind of move uh, associates around is that the responsibilities also ratchet up with your experience uh, and, and your abilities and interest. Uh, and so you may be working on a healthcare project for, for three months or six months, uh, and then, hey, I want to try something else different. But you've already acquired these wonderful data skills. You've already acquired these uh, critical thinking skills. And so you can get you know, to the next level of like starting to supervise people and starting to uh, uh, guide their work and, and be responsible for the uh, quality of control and quality assurance of their work. And so there is um, not only kind of just this broadening of understanding of, of tools and knowledge and, and, and deepening what you're learning here at UVA, uh, but then also you're, you're starting to figure out professional skills that are transferable from litigation consulting to anything else that comes down the pike. Uh, and, and we've had uh, great success with people uh, developing within BRG and, and continuing on. Um, I like to say that our uh, office director uh, started out as an associate and, and moved her way up to managing director. Um, uh, and, so that, and, and without going to graduate school. And, and that's just a, a really interesting aspect of our culture, um, whereas a lot of other litigation consulting firms are you know, two years and then it's time for you to go to graduate school or whatever. Um, so there's absolutely a career trajectory for people uh, who choose not to go to graduate school. Um, and most of our associates, even if they do choose to go to graduate school, tend up staying for more than two years, two, three, four, five years, and so on. Um, and so there's just a massive amount of learning uh, from each other, uh, but then also helping to teach others as you uh, supervise them and, and help to mentor them, uh, and then also reinforces your learning. And so that really... Um, uh, from a career perspective, I think, uh, provides a, a very grounded opportunity or a, 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 a rich opportunity for you to develop uh, a large skill set um, that, again, are transferable either to graduate school, if you wanted to 
PhD, MBA, whatever, or if you want to go to a different uh, organization or a different industry altogether, all those skills are transferable. Uh, and you'll have, my, my instinct is based on what I've seen, ultimately we'll have more, ex uh, more experience at, and more responsibility uh, at an organization like DRG than you would necessarily at another organization like a Fortune 200 company, for example. Um, and so that's, I, I think, basically uh, all I had to say was, uh, was the... Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, so just, I hope for the students that you have been able to, to, to pull together both the variety that both of these guys talked to. They both spoke about the variety of the work, but also this kind of cumulative work of human capital accumulation from working on one project that has complementarity relationships to working on a project in a totally different industry. And yet through the kind of magic of this type of work, collaborative, intellectually stimulating, you actually develop skills that become transferable across different sectors of the economy. All right, my understanding now is we're gonna to turn to the handshake portion and uh, so I'm going to bow out and let Jen Jones, if she has any instructions as to how this happens, or maybe everybody knows exactly what's supposed to happen next. But thank you for letting me participate as sort of the quasi host of the event. Uh, thanks a lot again. I'll turn it over to Jen. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Professor Elzinga. And thank you, Ben and Kevin, for being here. 